Well, so uh, thanks, Chris, for that introduction. I, I, he took seriously my threat uh, that I have just as much material on him as he has on me. So, <laughs> so he didn't tell you the really good stories about, uh, uh, about and I'll probably refrain from that too. But uh, in any case, it really, it's great to be back here. It's, uh, there's nothing like a couple of years in Washington to make you realize what a special place this is. <laughs> how nice it is to be able to live and work here. Um, and so, uh, so in the next few minutes, I'd just like to talk about sort of three things. I, I wanna look back a bit at where we were. Uh, I mean, Sally did a very nice job of this and Persis did as well, but I'll, I'll try to give you my perspective on what's transpired in the 15 years since we, uh, we started GSEP. And, and look a bit at the world around us um, as well. Uh, and the second thing is to consider uh, where we stand in this uh, global transition that's ahead of us to make the world's energy systems much cleaner and to have much lower greenhouse gas emissions. And there's some, some good news there. Um, and then the third is to imagine where the path might uh, uh, take us in the future and what the roles of the, the many GSIP supported universities and research teams might look like uh, as well. So, so Chris, um, Chris is right, he, we, um, we competed for the uh, project that ended, ended up in, uh, at uh, Princeton, the Carbon Mitigation Initiative, and we didn't get it. Um, and uh, so then we backed up and we said, well, okay, what, uh, which, what are we trying to do here? So um, we, we started a conversation, actually the very first conversation was with Schlumberger, uh, but then we very quickly moved to, uh, to ExxonMobil as well. And it was pretty clear that there was this recognition amongst uh, all of us in one way or another that the, the supply of affordable, clean energy uh, is, is really an essential foundation of modern societies. And that, that, uh, we, that, that universities should have a responsibility to be working on these and to, to be trying to be to think about the bigger systems as well as uh, uh, making progress on all the individual pieces it takes to transform all of that. So there was a series of meetings and details discussions that really started in the fall of 2001. Um, and then I'm, there was a lot of conversation here and, it, and actually it was, uh, it was very useful part of all of this. We were ready to, to announce the uh, the, the formation of GSEP in the fall of 2002. Um, and the goal was really just to bring together talented research groups here at Stanford and at many other institutions around the world to work on this challenge of supplying the energy the world needs but with much lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now, I, I can say with absolute authority that the conversations with the companies were hugely helpful and not just for the financial support. That, Support, of course, was, uh, you know, certainly got plenty of attention here on the campus and around the world. I had a thousand emails the day after the, the uh, announcement was made. My favorite of those was the guy who said, $200 million, eh, tiny against the, the uh, size of the, uh, the challenge. Invest your money with us and we'll return it 10 times over and you'll be fine. <laughs> We, we didn't do that. Um, so, in, but in any case, the, what we were trying to do here was to think much more carefully about how to talent, uh, harness the talents of university researchers to work on a pretty big challenge uh, and to make that effort be more than the sum of the parts. Now, for, for all those conversations at that time and in the years that followed the, the original sponsor companies, uh, ExxonMobil, GE, Schlumberger, and Toyota, and then those that joined later, DuPont and Bank of America. Um, they have my personal heartfelt thanks, uh, and, f uh, and I know the thanks of Stanford and all the institutions that, were, that became part of GSEP with their support. So when, with the agreement in place, we went to work uh, here to try to figure out how to attack the challenge. I remember saying at one point that I thought the toughest initial challenge was to get an account number out of the Stanford accounting system, uh, but we did eventually uh, accomplish that. Uh, and we settled on a, a process that, that Sally described with workshops, uh, the talented members of the research community around the world, 
uh, to define areas where we thought we could make a difference with the scale of the investment that we could make. Um, and we issued calls for proposals in a variety of areas, and, and, but always kept a little aside for the, uh, the proposal that uh, didn't fit in any of the areas, but was so interesting that we just had to, to, uh, to do it. We did try to avoid violating the second law, but, um, but otherwise we were, we were open to the idea that, uh, that uh, we could make, um, uh, make some bets that would be uh, interesting and impossible to find in the standard risk-averse uh, uh, federal review system. Um, so we built a peer review process to identify proposals based on high-quality science or engineering science that had a pathway for impact on greenhouse gas emissions if the worst search was successful, and that were step out in some sense. The idea was to encourage projects that might involve high technical risk could, but had, could have big impact if successful. Um, and you've, you'll hear about lots of, Sally gave a lovely review. I'm, I want to steal those slides, by the way, Sally, so I, I, uh, I'm warning you now. Um, the, that, uh, the, uh, there's, just, <laughs> there's just been so much that's been accomplished. Um, we, there are annual reports for all of this from the project, hundreds of published papers and more presentations that can be counted, at least by me, uh, and lots of patents. So, um, but I think the real product of all of this has been the talented people who've uh, flowed through these programs. Uh, the leverage that comes from the students, the postdocs, the faculty members, um, and uh, both here and at the other institutions, they multiply the impact of the support from GSEP many, many, many times over. Um, and I note also that this uh, turned out to be quite an education for me in the energy R&D landscape. Uh, and that actually came in handy when I went to Washington. Um, if I was qualified for that job at all, which I have some doubts, uh, it was GSEP's fault. Uh, this, was, this was quite the, the, uh, the useful uh, education for me. And, and I have to say a totally reliable joke at DOE was to say that 25 years of trying to lead an academic institution where no faculty member ever did anything because some dean or institute director uh, told them to, was good practice for working in the federal government. <laughs> so now I need to, to take just a moment and say a word or two about the people here at Stanford who worked so hard to make this uh, possible. Chris Edwards, you know, he was uh, signed on at the very beginning as he pointed out. Um, he, most of the good ideas about how we figured out how to do stuff were his. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, thanks for all that. He, he and I traveled the world. Um, one of uh, our sponsor reps, uh, Bob Wimmer, uh, uh, suffered through uh, what must have been an hour-long conversation in a taxi in Kyoto about how we were going to manage the peer review system. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he thought we, would, we academics would never actually get to a decision, uh, but we did eventually uh, get there. Um, uh, Nancy Sandoval and Maxine Lim joined us soon after we got going, um, and uh, they're still here contributing today. Uh, Richard Sassoon, of course, joined us. We, we told him at the time that we were hiring him to do all the work that Chris and I were supposed to do but didn't want to, um, and that, uh, that turned out to be right, didn't it, uh, Richard? Uh, so it turned out there was enough for all of us to do. Um, and we put together a, a small team, uh, came to be known as the A-team, the analysis team, um, that to, to help us think about this whole question of where the research opportunities are and where, you know, where should we try to engage? I mean, it's pretty clear that you can't do everything. And, uh, that, and I, Steve Jobs once said, well, deciding what not to do is, a, is every bit as important as uh, what you do do. So, um, so that included uh, folks like Wes Herman and Emily Hung and Paolo Bossard and A.J. Simon and Jenny Milne. Um, uh, Jenny is, uh, is still with us. The others are, are doing um, uh, interesting things in all kinds of places. Uh, and then Lee Wood joined us from the administrative side to set up a new unit in the university. Um, that may not seem like a startup, but uh, in fact it is. <laughs> it took a lot of uh, care and feeding in the early days. And then of course the team continued to involve as we formed the Precourt Institute and tried to broaden our scope across the, uh, the university as a whole. And um, 
and so uh, that team deserves uh, uh, my thanks uh, for making it look like I accomplished something that was really done by all of us together. Um, so now some of us have moved on to other challenges, including me, uh, but then adding Sally Benson and Arun Majumdar to the GSEP pre-court group uh, illustrates nicely the important principle that uh, organizations do fine as long as the old folks are rep replaced by smarter new ones. Uh, and so uh, thank you two for, uh, for joining us as well. And then finally, of course, nothing would have happened without the, the enthusiastic support of the, uh, and response of the Stanford students and faculty. So where do we stand now? Well, I'll start uh, by saying that uh, really uh, what uh, uh, Persis Strell said, GSEP transformed this university from an, uh, an energy standpoint. Um, we had lots going on. It was widely scattered across the university. Um, some of us knew each other. Um, Chris and I obviously didn't know each other. I remember a conversation where the, I was standing there with a group of these guys at the, the same meeting, and they were all like two feet taller than I am. Uh, and um, and uh, I, I kind of walked up and said uh, that, uh, could I join the, the conversation? And uh, Chris said, uh, well, it's a very high level conversation. <laughs> which established that he had a, enough of a sense of humor to be able to survive the, uh, the startup in the university. Um, but what GSEP did was to, to provide a vehicle for bringing people together in, in interesting ways. Um, and we, you know, we never said in any calls for proposals, this needs to be interdisciplinary. We didn't say that. But what we did say was we wanted stuff that was step out. And the way that groups figured out how to, to get to the step out requirement here, which was going beyond what had been done in that research group for the last uh, uh, decade or so, all of that's very important, but we wanted to try to occupy a different niche. Um, they often banded together with uh, other uh, research groups to work on some problem that uh, neither group thought they could pull off on their own. Um, and, uh, and that created a whole bunch of links, and it did so whether or not GSEP funded the project. Um, because the teams had such a good time figuring out how to propose this that if they got funded, great. If they didn't, they were, they were disappointed. But we provided lots of feedback on the proposals and then they went back and either sometimes came back to us, sometimes got them funded somewhere else. And so what this did was to provide a whole lot of cross-linking across the university uh, in a way that really has been hugely productive and way beyond the, the amount of support that Jeeves have provided uh, uh, directly. So, so that challenge, putting that, that challenge in front of a bunch of really talented, creative people was exactly the right thing to do. And then eventually, of course, we decided that it made sense to give this an organizational home uh, and the Precord Institute for Energy was the, uh, the, the result. The way that um, Stanford has dealt with um, this question of how do you work on hard things that cut across the whole university has been to form interdisciplinary institutes. And we did the same thing in the area of the environment. Um, we have people all across the campus and reorganizing the whole university to bring them together seemed like that was hard. Uh, so instead, we've, we've used the interdisciplinary in institutes as a way to bring people together. So at that point, of course, I had this, the challenge and uh, uh, opportunity of a second organizational startup on campus. Um, obviously, I don't learn lessons rapidly. I'd, uh, uh, that th that's a lot of work, um, uh, but it has been great fun to watch uh, uh, the Precourt Institute develop. Um, and I, you know, Jeff Kossoff was mentioned, he and I spent our whole careers at Stanford ignoring institutional boundaries, and this was another, another case of it because, uh, so we, we pull some parts of the, the uh, energy research effort into the Precourt Institute, and other parts kind of stayed where they were, but we created a, uh, a, uh, an executive committee that had all the people that led those programs uh, on the executive committee, whether or not they, they were a formally a part of the institute, and then made that the group, the, the group that worked together. And so, again, that kind of helped bring us all together. And we have a lot going on here. Um, others, uh, uh, Persis mentioned it, Sally did as well, so I won't go through my list of uh, all the cool things that are going on, but uh, it really has been exciting to watch, um, and I think it has tremendous um, potential for the future. And I would say that there's been lots of uh, similar kinds of development at other institutions. 
I've lost track of how many talks I gave at other universities about, about the kinds of things that we were trying to do. And, uh, uh, and uh, certainly the funding that GSEP provided helped uh, make that point at other universities as well. Um, I don't think GSEP uh, deserves all the credit for that, obviously, but uh, I do think we had some influence. Um, and so I think we've made some significant progress on one of the goals of GSEP, which was to harness the talents of uh, good university research teams to work in a focused way on the energy and climate uh, challenge. And we have made a lot of progress in the last decade here, if you think about it. The, if you just look at the costs of, of um, uh, some of the renewables, um, uh, wind power is down by about 40% over the last uh, eight years. Utility scale solar down by 64%. Um, LED lights now are 94% cheaper than they were, less expensive than they were uh, uh, years ago. That, I think that says something about how to get to scale when the unit cost is small versus if uh, you buy a lot of light bulbs, you don't buy a lot of nuclear power plants. So it's a different, uh, it's a different scale of things. Um, but it, it does say something about the question of getting to scale in the market. Um, and in, the, in a transition from coal to natural gas power generation, um, this last year coal um, um, uh, was down to 30% from 50% eight years ago, and, uh, and uh, natural gas was 34%. So, um, so there's, there's really been a big change um, in all of this. And it's, it's fun to see um, how that, uh, uh, that will develop going forward. So, uh, and if you think about, for example, appliances and vehicles um, uh, and more and better efficiency, uh, we, we also have a better uh, uh, feeling for why that benefits uh, all of us. So I think the transformation is, is now well underway. Um, things are measurably cleaner already, uh, but we still have quite a lot to do. So now the international situation has also evolved rapidly since GSEP was uh, established. In 2003, Chris Edwards and I um, traveled the world uh, meeting with university groups to encourage uh, uh, proposals to GSEP. Uh, we went to lots of institutions in Europe and Asia, and we were welcomed everywhere, absolutely. But it was clear that opinions varied quite a bit as to the urgency of the work that we were uh, suggesting on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And in China, for example, uh, researchers were much more concerned about questions of air quality improvements than they were about CO2 emissions. In fact, the truth was they didn't really want to talk about CO2 emissions. Um, I think it's astonishing that in here 14 years later, um, uh, China, uh, at least at the high, highest levels in the Chinese government, um, has taken on a leadership role and I think their announcement uh, uh, of a willingness to um, uh, uh, come to Paris with a nationally determined contribution along with the U.S. Um, help make all of that possible, which is, that's not to discount the, the challenges that still remain there. Um, but the fact that uh, the, the Paris Agreement uh, uh, was agreed to by 195 nations uh, is, I think, a significant step forward. Think back to Copenhagen and where that didn't go. Um, this was a way to uh, get forward. And even uh, granting the varying degrees of ambition amongst the countries, um, I think it's a significant step. And I think it will continue to be an important vehicle even if the U.S. follows through on its announced intention to withdraw. So what about the future? Well, it's good to pause once in a while and say, ah, great, you know, we actually made some progress. Uh, but uh, I'm here to say that there's a lot more to do. Uh, what is it? Was it Sally that said the 36 billion tons more to do? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a pretty big challenge. Um, I think we'll look back on this time as one of a real acceleration in the, in the kind of progress that we uh, need to make, but it's accelerating from a pretty small base, so we, uh, we need to go much further. Uh, the developing world, of course, is less far along in seeing its activities as profoundly linked to life and society, so there are uh, some challenges there. Um, and gosh, there's the politics. Um, I have no intention of trying to, to uh, describe all of that or, uh, uh, or resolve it, but I will say that um, we're in the midst of one of those disagreements now about how much and how fast to work on energy environment uh, uh, problems. Um, 
And you know, there's been, for those of us who work on it, there's been some disturbing news of late. Um, deep budget uh, reductions for the science uh, and energy uh, uh, part of the US uh, federal support is part of that. But I'm reminded of a lesson that I learned pretty quickly in uh, Washington, and that was that the, the president's budget is not necessarily what gets appropriated. The Congress thinks they're in charge of the budget, and guess what? They are. Uh, so, so I think uh, you know, there's something to be said for all of us being willing to talk about what's important and why it, the work needs to be done. Um, and if that conversation involves uh, members of Congress, fair enough. Um, so what are we trying to accomplish anyway? Um, it seems to me that the overall goal for the US energy system um, is something that's efficient, diversified, clean, secure and resilient, economically competitive, uh, and environmentally responsible. And we can do a huge amount with, uh, with uh, current technologies that are available, but that are making their way to scale. But I think we also need to take advantage of the creativity of folks the, that are here uh, for more innovation. Um, and indeed, economies that, uh, that are are good at the energy innovation, because it's woven through uh, the basis of modern societies, those societies will be better uh, able to compete in the economics of the world. Um, and I, so I think that's a responsibility that all of us have some role to play in. Um, energy is supplied and used as a commodity, so costs and markets and competition do matter. And indeed, if we're going to get to scale, they, we have to do it on the basis of cost. You can, subsidies can work for a while, but you really do uh, have to, to uh, get to, to scale if you're going to. Um, and the, the International Energy Agency says there's something like a $60 trillion international energy market to be captured between now and 2040. And, uh, and at least 15, billion, 15 trillion of that will be clean energy kinds of things. So um, I think the US should be in a position to lead the way in that market and that we have the talent and capacity to do it uh, if we can support the work appropriately. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we remember that we're in this for the long haul. We really do have to take the long view here, but we also need to retain a sense of urgency. Uh, changing human systems and economies to an interact in a more benign way with the environment does not happen overnight, uh, although we've seen pretty good progress at a surprising rate recently. And putting off the changes we need to make to protect health and security will make the transition harder and more expensive. Second, we just need to recognize that there's just this wonderfully huge opportunity space for innovation. You know, uh, Sally talked about a bunch of the areas, energy storage, chemistries, uh, uh, a modern grid. I probably spent more time trying to persuade Congress to invest more in, uh, in the grid uh, than any other uh, topic I worked on, and there were lots of different ones uh, in Washington. Um, you know, we need to be able to accommodate the intermittent um, uh, renewables, distributed generation, be resilient to weather insults and forest fires and, uh, and cyber attacks. We've been reminded of that in Puerto Rico and California here. Um, and we need more efficient water purification and better sensors for methane emission reduction. We need to reduce the cost of carbon capture and storage and we need to focus on wide ranging energy efficiency in absolutely everything we do. Uh, we've left ourselves a lot of room to do better on energy efficiency in this country. So we need to put together the, the fundamental science of catalysis and nanostructured materials to make devices that range from batteries to fuel cells to chemical reactors better. And we need to develop the next generation of advanced scientific computing that will support all the other disciplines and to tackle the many challenges of complex systems of systems that support modern societies. But the good news is that there's a huge well of human crea creativity to be tapped to work on these challenges. Uh, I just know that's true from watching the students uh, who uh, come to us here at Stanford. Investing across a portfolio of technologies, of systems, of markets, of timescales for application and of funding sources, and also of research players is an essential element of progress at the kind of rate we need to demonstrate. So fostering a seamless interaction of fundamental and applied energy research is fully consistent with the way GSEP has operated 
and we need to take that as a model of how to go forward. We should continue to build on that strength here and elsewhere, um, and the kind of work that has been done with GCEP support is every bit as important now as it was when we started, and we need to stick with that effort going forward. And third, we should remember that innovation isn't a single event of invention, uh, at least most of the time it isn't. Instead, it's a, it's a fabric of ideas, devices, technology, regulation, markets, consumer preferences, and behavior, that's the hard part, and scale of deployment. Progress on hard problems is faster when we bring talented people together with very different skills and perspectives together to attack the challenges in new ways. And asking hard questions of very inventive people is an essential component of that. So I'll stop here, but I'll say at the end that there's uh, an urgent need to work on global problems of energy and the environment at a truly vigorous pace. We humans can be incredibly inventive when we make up our minds to work on a challenge. And I think we'll look back, as I said, as, uh, on this time as one that reflects a real acceleration in the pace of deployment of cleaner human systems. So let's pause and say thank you to the companies that supported GSIP. Take a minute to appreciate what has been accomplished so far by so many talented students and faculty, as well as the companies in their own efforts, and then charge ahead. We can do this, so let's get to work. This is like class, you know, you just need the first student to, to uh, ask a, a question and then, and then the dam's broken. Uh, why, why not continue the project? I mean, it provides a vehicle which has structure and, and energy behind it. Yeah, well, we are, we are continuing. We were just changing the format a bit. So it's, uh, this, is, this absolutely is going to continue. Um, the sponsor group will change and the format will change some, but, uh, but, but we're certainly continuing and we're continuing to build and support the Precord Institute. So we're not stepping back in any way. Uh, some years ago, I think about halfway through GSEP's uh, career, uh, the state, uh, California, did a study about uh, what we need to get to the kind of 80% less CO2. And uh, as I recall the results, they got about 60% they could see the technologies and the economics getting about a 60% cut. But that last half going from 40% to 20% was going to require new things. Uh, has uh, GSEP's analysis or others you did at DOE uh, confirmed that? or? And are the technologies that you're targeting fitting into doing that last half of the reduction? So the answer to both of those questions is yes. That, uh, that uh, right toward the end of the time I was in Washington, um, we took a look at uh, uh, the, it, what would happen if we just met all the, GC, the current uh, DOE goals for technology for cost reductions mostly and, uh, and technical improvements. And, um, and that, that made a, quite a significant uh, contribution, but if we really wanted to go further, we had to do more. Uh, we, could, we could see a pathway for pretty deep um, uh, carbon reductions associated with electric power generation, but it was quite a bit harder for transportation and, uh, uh, and for industry, and in both of those settings, we uh, really needed uh, um, uh, some more advances. I mean, you could see lots of areas to work on, but we certainly needed to do more. Uh, I think that's still true in, um, in California, and uh, it, it both illustrates the, the, uh, the opportunity and the challenge for, for uh, people that do the kind of work that's done here and at the other institutions GSEP has supported. Uh, what can you say about the most pressing issues uh, in energy and climate in the developing countries and opportunities? Well, I think the first challenge is access. Uh, that uh, it's, uh, we really need to be thinking about how to provide uh, uh, access to, to what all of us take completely for granted uh, 
uh, uh, just electricity and uh, uh, and all the and and air conditioning and all the refrigeration, the the modern energy services that uh, that we all take for granted. Um, uh, the second challenge is that the um, and maybe it's an opportunity as well that uh, particularly if you look in Africa, for example, um, I mean we have we have a, a grid here that's resilient, well except for Puerto Rico, um, and it uh, uh, we can get things going again. In many places in Africa, there is no grid, so so that's a place where um, uh, distributed generation, microgrids, uh, use of even some power. India is another version of this, um, can really improve lives in a in a big way at at modest cost for now, even as the systems uh, are built going forward. And there are plenty of of sort of political and regulatory and rule of law challenges to be addressed at the same time there. So. Um, I, I don't discount the, the magnitude of those challenges, but I think we have a responsibility as a world to try to work on them and to, and to make some progress. This is the traveling salesman problem, so which, uh, which, uh, which is fast? Good. Um, hi, um, oh. my, I, I have a question for you about uh, the kind of global politics of energy. Um, you were talking about how China, you felt, was able to take the lead in a different way than the United States currently is. Um, I worked in the auto industry, and it's interesting how China was able to unilaterally provide fuel economy requirements for their vehicles, concerned with air pollution. Do you, I wanted to ask a kind of question about which, is there a style of governance that may be more effective for improving um, climate policy. True. Where didn't we prohibit the hard questions? <laughs> Jeez. Um, well, uh, you know, I think actually, I mean, if you look across uh, the spectrum of uh, of Europe and the United States, and then the, I don't know, the chaotic de democracies like uh, India and the U.S. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, or China, you know, I think there, there are existence proofs for making progress in all of them. Um, and uh, there, you know, in some ways it's easier to work on some problems in one setting than, than in others. I don't think there's, uh, there's any uh, obvious advantage of one or another. And I, I don't want to pay too pic uh, rosy a picture of China because, I mean, China is busy investing in all kinds of, uh, of renewable technologies, but they're also um, in the uh, the one belt, one road uh, out there flogging uh, uh, coal-fired power plants around the world and building more than a few of those themselves. So, so um, it's, it, you know, like, like here, it's not, it's not simple. Um, and uh, the human systems that we use to organize societies uh, all have to wrestle in one way or another with the same kinds of problems. China, I think, uh, I said the, the, that I came away from that trip that, that Chris and I uh, Meant, uh, did in uh, 2003, thinking that the only real hope for, for engaging China at that point was air quality concerns. And I think that's a big part of the motivation that's, uh, that's moving them now, and for very good reason. I mean, in some ways, their cities now are like ours, Pittsburgh and Houston, where I grew up, and LA were like in the mid-1960s. The, the air was really uh, terrible. So um, I would point back to that time as one where where we had a dispute in this country uh, over air and water quality that uh, it really echoed many of the same kinds of uh, conversations we're having now about the climate challenge. Uh, and what happened then was, of course, that California said, well, heck with you feds. We're choking to death. We have to do something. And some more states went along and to oversimplify a big, complicated process, eventually industry was in Washington saying, look, 50 sets of rules not OK. Give us, give us some rules, some certainty that all of us comply and we'll do it. Uh, and so the Clean Air Act passed and, the, and here we are, you know, f you know 47 years later. Um, we haven't solved every air quality problem, but gee, it's a heck of a lot better than it was. So I think the, the message is that you start, you work on the things that, uh, that make sense economically at the time and you stick with it over time and, uh, and we can make progress. It's hard to do overnight, these are big systems. Um, but uh, I think you can deal with that in almost any of the, the government systems if you have the right 
political will to do it. Good morning. Uh, I, I wanted to point out that the city of New York has a, uh, an aggressive a goal of reducing their um, greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050, a large part of which will be accomplished by the deep energy retrofit of over 90% of built existing stock in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, what you can tell me about um, the university's efforts in understanding how we most cost effectively and um, uh, yeah, cost effectively uh, learn how to uh, retrofit our existing building stock to reduce the use of energy. Yeah. This is actually a problem that we've had some experience with here at Stanford, and I, I'm certainly aware of the, of the New York effort. It's, it's a hugely big uh, challenge given the, the age of the building stock there. But Stanford, uh, we have a, a, a stock of buildings, some of which were built a long time ago as well. And we've just, in the last few years, revamped our energy system here on campus completely. Um, so we, uh, it, it's based on the idea that uh, all year round we, we take uh, uh, thermal energy out of buildings with cooling and at the same time put thermal energy back in in, uh, in heating somewhere else and that if you use heat pumps to take the, the thermal energy out of the chilled water stream and push it back into the, the hot stream, uh, you don't buy a whole heck of a lot of fuel uh, for a long time. Now, you have to have electricity to do this, but if you also work on, uh, which we've, we've done, on purchasing clean electricity and installing our own uh, um, uh, renewables component there, then we, the, the, the CO2 reduction from this, just this campus is really quite remarkable. Uh, it's, it's, it's close to 70% uh, from our peak. Um, and it's well below the 1990 levels for the university. So, so it just says that there's a, there's a big target there. Um, some of the, lots of energy efficiency things have negative amortized costs. That is, they pay, them, pay for themselves. But others, the kind of deep retrofit that New York is talking about is gonna cost actual money. So, um, uh, we do have a team here working on energy efficiency and, uh, and buildings, so um, I, I grant you that it's a big area with, uh, with lots of potential to, to go forward. Okay, hi, I'm Warren Linney. I'm with the uh, Drawdown Project, Paul Hawkins Group, mm -hmm. and also uh, the Healthy Climate Initiative. Um, I just returned from the uh, forest fires and. Sonoma County helped a lot of friends, family evacuate. Um, I think it's clear that just reducing emissions, getting down uh, even by 36, you know, megaton, gigatons, um, we have to actually start drawing down some of the CO2 in the atmosphere, reduce these hurricanes and um, potential forest fires. Do you see that this would be the new emphasis of GSEP to actually do a lot more uh, drawdown technologies, which I know we're all working on right now, but that could be, I think, the real push that mm -hmm. we could provide. Yeah, so well, some of the technologies that we're talking about and thinking about, uh, particularly on the biological side, um, uh, offer the opportunity to, to do some drawdown. Um, I'm, I remain unconvinced that, uh, that capture of CO2 directly out of the air makes any sense with mechanisms other than plants. Um, just because the, the, the thermodynamic cost of working with that low concentration is, uh, um, and, and, and those devices don't ever self-assemble the way plants do. Um, so, so I think the biological pathway for direct air capture is, uh, is one possibility. But, um, but there, there are many, many, many other options, and they're certainly included in the technology, ranges of technologies that we consider. And GSEP really works on the technology side, but the Precord Institute works across the, the, the full spectrum. So um, there, there's plenty there to do. And uh, the Drawdown Project, I think, is uh, I've just been contemplating how to use that in my, uh, my, my sophomore seminar with the, uh, that deals with the uh, technology in the greenhouse. So thanks for all the work that was done there. That's uh, very helpful. <laughs>